Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video we're going to be discussing the concept of Avogadro's hypothesis. Okay, so, so far by now that you've seen the demonstration on um, what we would call the Hoffman voltameter. The idea that, um, that we took a sample of water and we used um, electrical energy. So if we had our water molecule um, and we used electrical energy to split it into hydrogen and oxygen. So we could take a compound and use a large amount of energy in the form of electricity to split it into its elements. And that we see this concept of the 2 to 1 ratio. We produce twice as much hydrogen as we do oxygen. So therefore that suggests that in that compound we have twice as many hydrogens as oxygens, leading us to propose the formula of HO, H2O. Okay? Um, but so the, this is the way that the early chemists actually were able to develop um, their knowledge about what compounds were like. They could look at how they could take elements and form a compound, they could look at a compound, break it into its elements, and carefully measure masses and volumes to be able to, to draw some conclusions, to make some inferences from their um, observations. Okay, but so then this kind of leads us to the, this concept called the Avogadro hypothesis. So Avogadro um, was one of the early pioneer chemists doing a lot of work to do with gases. And so let's say that he had that we had samples of two different gases. Okay? Okay. So we've recognized which is what we it's actually it's a relationship called Avogadro's law that with um, samples of gases that pressure is proportional to temperature. Okay, so in this, each of these boxes have equal volumes. Okay, so I realise that my drawings might make that a bit hard to um, to to um, to imagine, but bear with me. So we've got the same volumes, so boxes of the same size. Now, if we see that the pressure, the pressures are equal, and the temperatures are equal, okay, then what we can do is we can actually draw some conclusions about what is what are the number of particles in each box. That if we can say, right, well, if the pressures are equal, the temperatures are equal, the volumes are equal, then even though we have a gas, gases with different particles, the black ones over here and red ones over here, but then we can actually make the next logical step and say, well, everything else is kept the same, okay? that it, it's then reasonable for us to say that they have the same number of particles in each box. Okay, and so then what that means is that then we get to this idea of, um, uh, yeah, so the, the Avogadro hypothesis. So if at the same, so at the, as long as we have the same, the gases at the same temperature and pressure, that equal volumes of any two gases contain an equal number of particles. Okay. And so, what that means is, is it's actually very profound, is that even though it looks very kind of, so what, at this point. Because it means that, from the early chemist's kind of perspective, that now they could actually compare any two gases, and as long as they could control the, t the pressure and the temperature, that then they could make direct, um, draw direct conclusions from their observations of what volume of gas that they had. They knew that if the temperature and pressure were the same, they knew that if we produce 200 mils of gas A and 100 mils of gas B, that we had double the particles of A, double particles. That is, we had we have two A for every one B. Okay, so by by looking at this relationship, where previously we couldn't couldn't draw that conclusion because we didn't know about how those particles were kind of arranging themselves in the gas. But so now we can actually then say, right, well, therefore, that we have twice as much A as we do B. Okay, and then likewise, if we take 200 mils of A and react it with 100 mils of B to make a certain amount of product, then that allows us to draw conclusions about what that compound is like. Okay, we're also going to revisit this, this concept um, in, in reverse, or kind of, kind of the flip it around to have a look at some things in a little bit of a later date. Okay, 
So this means we can now kind of build our understanding to look at how gases combining um, in simple kind of whole number ratios um, can can then kind of allow us to deduce the formula of compounds made from gases. Okay, so if we said, you know, that we had two volumes of hydrogen, like like you know, if we kind of use this word um, volume being kind of like a a vague but um, comparable kind of space or amount of gas reacting with one volume of oxygen and then we get water. Okay, so if we say, all right, well, I've got, okay, let's let's say that each box is, has, has, each volume is three particles worth. Okay, and so then we've got, so two volumes of hydrogen with one volume of oxygen, then we're getting, these are our water particles. Okay, so for each water particle, we use two lots of our hydrogen for every one of our oxygen. And so then that allows us to infer the formula of H2O. Um, because Dalton went to his deathbed firmly believing that water had the formula of HO. We now recognise that that's incorrect. Um, but so then that's, that's kind of um, the way that we can draw that conclusion. And so looking along with the, the sheet that you've got there, we're, we're going to skip one and then move down to when we think about nitrogen and hydrogen combining together to make a substance called ammonia. Okay, and recognising that we have three, uh, sorry, for every one volume of nitrogen that reacts, that we need three times as much, three volumes worth of hydrogen. Okay, so that suggests that for every, because we have, for every one of these we need three of these, then that means that in ammonia, for every one nitrogen, I have three hydrogens. And so we can give it the formula of NH3. But now we come to something a little bit stickier. Okay, so in example three that you've hopefully put together by now, or at least you're going to come back to, looking at this concept of hydrogen plus chlorine reacting, so with one volume of each, then producing hydrogen chloride. Okay, if we do it like this, this is how you did it. So you end up with hydrogen chloride, HCl. But what was often, what was measured at this point is recognising that, okay, if they got one volume of hydrogen and reacted with one volume of chlorine, that they actually got two volumes of hydrogen chloride, twice as much as they expected. Now, we've talked about the concept of conservation of mass, that particles can't be made, you know, gain, that particles cannot be created or destroyed, that they, they're rearranged. Um, and so the, the number of particles that we have over here needed to originate from somewhere. And so what that then allowed chemists to actually deduce, or that the only explanation they could develop for it, is that they still had one volume of each. However, each hydrogen particle must have two atoms connected together. Each chlorine particle must have two chlorine atoms connected together. So that then, when they combine to form hydrogen chloride, then we would end up with the right number of particles over here. Okay, so what this suggested was that these substances, these elements, were known as, were called diatonic. That is, they have two atom molecules. Okay, so each, mo each molecule, each of these little lumps of hydrogen and lumps of chlorine um, contains two atoms connected together, fused together, which then helps to explain what we're observing over here. Okay, and so then what that allows us to do is to explain why, say, water, um, we, see a similar, we see a similar thing. That when we get two volumes of hydrogen reacting with one volume of oxygen, we end up with two volumes of water vapour. Okay, so then the idea that hydrogen is diatonic and that oxygen is also diatonic then helps to explain why we end up with double the amount of hydrogen that we would expect. 
Now, it's not changing the actual formula of our compound, we're not breaking chemistry here, but it does help us to account for the, the volumes that we would that we measure in the experiment here. So recognizing that me, um, that most um, non-metal elements are diatomic. And I would say except the noble gases. Okay, on the far right hand side of the periodic table. Okay, so that includes things like O2, N2, H2, Cl2, F2, I2, Br2. Okay, um, all the, so all of these are sorts of things that we would accept, that we can observe. Um, now there are some other non-metal elements that aren't diatomic. For example, we get sulfur 8, S8. Okay, so that kind of breaks the rule a little bit, but I'm just saying that most of the time when you're going to encounter a non-metal as an in elemental form, it will be a diatomic molecule. Okay, so please keep on the lookout for that. All right, keep going with the rest of the sheet, filling out the rest of the examples. Good luck, um, thanks for watching, and uh, the joke today um, comes courtesy of Reese. So if the Iron Man and the Silver Surfer teamed up, they'd be alloys. Peace out, thanks for watching, bye for now.